Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 552. This is 552 of the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host Agostino Zynga. I hope you're doing well wherever this show may find you. Hope you're doing well. Just checking myself out here on the camera. I've actually got a baseball cap on at the moment. Well, a trucker had to be specific and unfortunately the brim has now covered most of my head because I don't have adequate lighting it's now made my face completely dark which isn't too far from the truth right I'm not the most uh, fair skin of humans that you've probably ever seen in your life especially right I'd imagine so maybe this is quite close to home but it does look a bit mad and maybe if I put the brim up like that you can see my face a bit open do like that it's the gone dark do like that it goes open all right Maybe I can do it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm just trying to mix things up a bit, make things a bit more interesting. I don't think this is going to be the actual way to go forward with this sort of stuff. I think maybe it might be best to just kind of leave the hat off and make my face open. But hey, you know, you got to try some things sometimes. you got to try some things sometimes. I'm sat here sometime in the evening drinking myself a nice glass of green juice. Why not? And just enjoying life, innit? Just enjoying life. Just happy to be happy to be me <laughs> happy to be where i am and thankful that although i don't have a hundred million dollars in my bank account yet at the moment at least i don't have the whole entire internet you know with their pitchforks out ready to take me out because they feel like i'm getting too powerful because that must be a bit of a I wonder if it's scary it must be a bit scary right that kind of fall of knowing that there are people scheming and hacking away at plans to essentially um destroy your livelihood or destroy what you've worked hard for especially when it comes to your reputation because i think at this point if you're jorogan that's what i'm alluding to by the way there's no amount of damage that they can do that can essentially take away his wealth right he's hoarded all the money he's scrooge mcduck he's collected all the coins he's done very well for himself so it's not unlikely they're going to be able to take the money away from him and even if he does get you know quote unquote booted off of um, a platform like spotify or something most likely they're the ones that are going to be losing out because they'll have to pay him out of his contract i'll imagine that's what end up happening so he's definitely in a winning position in that regard but one thing that you do savor when you're that kind of guy is a reputation that you built up about yourself over you know a number of years this kind of um i wouldn't say an avatar but you've kind of there is a maybe it's a sort of avatar that you sort of um started to believe in and people started to believe in it so for that to get shattered it's pretty I'd imagine that's that's a pretty um hard pill to swallow. It's a pretty hard thing to kind of wrap your head around. More so if people around you start to change in a way they start to act with you. Maybe they don't pick up the phone as quickly. Maybe they're not replying back to text as quickly either. Like all those things are probably going to be wrangling in your head. But who knows? I think Joey is kind of one of those strong willed, strong minded guys. I'm sure he'll be okay and you'll kind of bounce back from it. And like I said before, I think it's a lot better to go through something like this knowing that you've got the financial security to basically weather any storm because i'd imagine part of the reason why a lot of people get stressed and really panic when it gets comes to getting cancelled is usually the same way the same reason why you'd get panicked and stressed if you're about to get fired at a job right if you were like down to your last warning you've been written up a few times you got given those weird um performance review things right you you're basically on your way to go out you usually panic and you're usually in a fire or flight mode because more likely than not firings don't come at the most advantageous time in your life right maybe you just decided to move into a new house you planned a big holiday you proposed your partner you're going to start a family something always happens it always kind of happens at the kind of worst time possible so usually your brain kind of stresses and goes into kind of survival mode because you need to kind of brace yourself for the impending doom coming up so that's why probably people panic a lot so i'd imagine getting fired and being cancelled are probably the same in terms of the levels of stress but like i said if you do have the financial security to weather the storm it makes it far easier to kind of not give a fuck the same way how you'd imagine no the same way how i remember these people that I used to work with sometimes you know you're working in a really cool company and then later on you'd realize time you know as time gone went by you'd bump into someone you used to work with and they'd kind of let you know oh you know that person you worked with they were the son of this person who's really rich or this person was that da, da, da. and then it suddenly started to make sense because you're like oh yeah no wonder when they were at work they didn't really care they were really they kind of came in to work with a kind of laissez-faire attitude it wasn't like you know they weren't trying to lay it all in the line it wasn't make it or not it was just you know they were just at work ready to do what they needed to do make friends and hang out 
and mostly it was because they had the financial security that would allow them to kind of um just go and fuck around and it'll be fine whereas people like you and i we don't have that ability we have to you know even when we work in a flipping crappy retail job you have to pretend you love the company just so you can keep it it's horrendous isn't it i've worked in bars and restaurants like that before or maybe or places that serve food and you have to pretend especially in an interview that it's your dream to work in this bowling alley you've loved this cinema chain you know you all you think about our movies you've got quentin tarantino posters up in your bedroom you have to make up so many flipping bullshit things just to make sure you can secure that nine that eight pound or you know seven pound uh an hour contract and yeah bloody hell my dad <laughs> honestly the things people the things employers make you do to have a job is just that's probably one of the best things to come out of the pandemic because um, a lot of people basically lost their jobs, especially people that are working middle, mid-level office jobs. They had to go back to working retail or doing stuff in hospitality. It kind of made the employers who, yeah, the employers who were hiring for those positions just to be a little bit more, um, to treat it as like a, to just treat it as what it is. So if you're trying to apply for those roles, they weren't trying to ask you questions about what, where do you see yourself in Tesco's in five years? No, they're just saying, hey, they're just trying to make sure you're competent, make sure you're not a psycho. And then, you know, that's it. Basically, you got the job. And that kind of made it a lot easier for people also to go into those jobs with a far better attitude than previously. Because before, they try and make it seem like it's a big deal. You go there, it's like not a big deal. And then you have a bad attitude. You start to not like your work. You start to get a little bit complacent. You maybe start to rub off on other people. You become a bad influence, blah, blah, blah. But when people just set the store with you and say, hey, this is what we're doing. If you just do your work, you leave on time, you come in on time, you leave on time, this lunch is this out uh, this long, the pay comes this day, we don't miss payments. I just standard things, holiday, you book it like this, vacation, da 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 da. Usually people would have a far better attitude coming in, but it's usually when things are left um open ended or vague or you know, um there's no clarification on anything and wait as you know, we'll, we'll what's that phrase they use at workplaces? Um we'll take it we'll take it every day. Every day we'll take it as it comes or something. You know the kind of phrase people use? So they can kind of avoid accountability or they just avoid kind of having to sit down and do the work annoying. But hey, what can one person do? So we've got many things to talk about, many things to jump on in on. So make sure you grab yourself a little drinky winky as I've got myself a little green juice and we're going to dive right on deep. That's good. It's good to have a little green juice in it just, as you, just to kind of keep it, everything ticking over. There was a time where at this sort of hour I would be ordering an Uber Eats, but when you, that's a good thing about seeing all these low cow dudes. I think I've been going through a bit of a weird phase where I've been watching loads of content concerning this guy called Mersh. Who I'm sure most of my viewers won't have any idea who he is, but he's one half of a podcast sort of live stream duo called Revenge of the Sis. And he's got his own thing too called Nightwave. And he's essentially the new um, de facto low cow. And low cow is just basically what it means, right? Um, guys on the internet who people basically laugh at and take the piss out of usually because of you know any number of things begging on the internet being a loser um thin skin whatever and you know i think for the most part most seem to have all three of those in abundance and i don't know what happens to make you a low cow. i don't know what the is precise moment or whether it's a collection of events and then suddenly people go okay you're a low cow. but uh, Mersh is the newest low car at the moment and there's many many compilation videos out there of him doing nutty stuff there's people interviewing ex-girlfriends and like it's just it goes crazy it really does go crazy with this kind of community so I've been em engrossing myself in all that over the weekend which has been fairly decent I'm not going to lie um what else oh I've been watching also the Reacher TV series um, if you're familiar with the books, Jack Reacher, and if you're familiar with the movie that came out, I think 2017, 2015, I forgot when it was, um, starring Tom Cruise, um, controversially so, because allegedly, or not allegedly, actually, in the books um, that were written, because I think it's like a crime sort of action series books that people seem to like, I think there's like five or six of them at the moment, but the guy in the books is meant to be a really physically imposing man like he's like six foot five he's ripped to shit do you know what I mean it's meant to be that's the whole point of jack reach that's why it's kind of an interesting story there's this kind of really big dude that's kind of sensitive that has to go through and work with the police and be kind of like, you know what i mean but anyway so they got the first thing wrong because tom cruise is not six foot five but oddly enough from what i've read online what i've seen online people that have watched the movie jack reacher with tom cruise is it jack reacher is it tom jack reacher tom cruise or is it tom cruise jack reacher 
Let's see, Tom Cruise, Jack Reacher. Is that, I think it's called Jack Reacher. Yeah, it is in 2012, so it's not 2645. Um, so it's 2012. But if anyone actually watched the movie, a lot of people actually liked it from what I've seen. It's got kind of favorable reviews. And this is also someone who's not usually the toast of the town when it comes to Tom Cruise. And the people kind of have a lot of um, negative comments to say about him personally, obviously, because of his lifestyle choices and religion, all that malarkey and part relationships. I don't really care. But, you know, people are not necessarily the biggest fans of his. And they actually like that movie. So if you don't, if you haven't read the books, the movie is quite good. But if you've read the books, people say the movie is a bit rubbish. But this series is really good. It's on Amazon, if I'm not mistaken. It's about six episodes long, unfortunately, or six or seven or eight, somewhere in that range. Um, so it's not the longest. So you don't get, in, you know, the, it kind of leaves you wanting more. The hours, the episodes are about an hour long, and they're really well done. I think I would have preferred more gore, more blood. Um, if that makes more sense, um, it seems like they've done like a really good PG version of how brutal they've they've kind of done a really good PG version of a of a John Wick scene. You know, John Wick scenes, right? When he's fighting and you know, me, bones are being broken, skin being ripped off, blood splattering all over the place. They've done a good job of kind of toning it down somewhat, so it's not too crazy. Um, don't give me yeah, don't give me in one episode he sticks he's flipping thumb in someone's eye, but still I want to see more of it up close. I want to see detail. But apart from that, the story is really good. Um, I think it's filmed really well. The guy that plays Jack Reacher is just you know, you think fuck, you know, people like that exist in real life. It's like Jesus Christ, <laughs> that's he's quite good in it. Um, the black detective in it is really good as well. I think he's really funny. I like his character. But yeah, if you're struggling for something to watch and you're open minded and you don't really mind going into stuff blind. I recommend checking out Reacher. I recommend checking out Reacher. And I've still got to do Yellowstone. I did two, ep no, I did one episode and it's so slow. It's like an hour and 10 minutes that first episode, I think. Um, so that's a lot of episodes to get through about cowboys and Indians um, in a modern setting. Supposedly it's meant to be like Sands of Anarchy, you know, set on horses, which is not too bad. But again, if anyone's a fan of Sands of Anarchy, they would definitely admit that towards the end of the latter seasons, it started to get a little bit ridiculous and a bit redundant. But again, not many good things to watch on TV at the moment. So you have to kind of take what you're given or go back into the archives and rewatch some of the classics. But I just, I don't know who has the time and who has the patience to sit down and watch Sopranos now or Mad Men. I would love to watch it blind. I really, really would. Because I think, you know, I could definitely see it with different eyes, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Really, really don't think so. Watching flipping Mad Men or Sopranos live, but those are some of the best series of all time but unfortunately what can we do in it what can we do so let's just jump on into it loads of stuff to talk about i don't want to waste too much of your time so obviously in the flurry of um it feels like this has come straight off the back of all the joe rogan stuff it looks like dandy newton um for whatever reason decided to get in front of a webcam and start crying that she's light-skinned um hilarious video really really does epitomize the you know the lack of self-awareness that exists in the higher echelons of hollywood or entertainment industry or in general or in life probably maybe if you just ask maybe if you just get to a certain level of life you just you know your head is literally in the clouds and you can't you can't basically see where you're meant to be standing but i don't know it's a ridiculous video ridiculous clip this is standing you and crying about being light-skinned and i'm really not joking I've wanted so desperately to apologize every day to, to, to darker skinned actresses. <laughs> I wanted so desperately to apologize to all the nignogs out there. I'm sorry for taking your jobs and your men. <laughs> like what? Oh, God almighty, Dandy. Auntie, what are you doing, man? Allow it. Turn off the webcam. I don't know, man. Buy a book. Do some Pilates or something. Like, what is this? This is not the vibe. This is not the vibe, Auntie. It's to say, I'm sorry that I'm told I'm the one chosen. My mama looks like you. <laughs> My mama is a darky like you. My mama. <laughs> My mama also likes that odo, 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 wele, wele, wele music. <laughs> oh, this is maybe this is maybe the explanation for this as well because I, I think if i'm not mistaken i saw some supercut i saw like yeah a longer version of this i think it was part of some tv show or something like you know being black in hollywood representation i don't know some garbage tv right um some equal opportunities let's take a box tv show type show 
but maybe this is kind of more so in um, a, re- a reflection of her current mind state maybe she's going through that thing that a lot of female actresses go through where no matter how beautiful you are unfortunately the older you get the role start to dry up it's annoying but it happens to be that way i think the only recent thing that i think can think of that kind of bucked that trend was the mayor of east town i forgot the lady who stars in it i think it's kate winslet is it kate winslet should be kate winslet that's the titanic woman right yes kate winslet so mayor of east town might be the only thing i've seen recently where an older actress lady um has the ability to basically be the leading role in a series and without it trying to make her look like she's 25 like they actually cast her as somewhat similar to what her real age is um but unfortunately in hollywood for every reason despite all the posturing they do about exclusivity diversity and wanting to be woke and what not me too representation for every reason if you're female like you have a real real short shelf life like it might be maybe late 40 it might be even early 40s maybe not even late early 40s and suddenly people start to cycle you out and get other people in so maybe she's kind of hitting that wall where suddenly the roles are not you know coming thick and fast pause um people are not calling back as quick as they were maybe in the past and now instead of just maybe realizing that that's a reality situation she's kind of trying to grasp at straws and maybe think oh no maybe now the reality of what she or what her skin of, yeah of her skin color is actually coming to 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 the front yeah to the to the front maybe she might be what she might be one of those people that are like oh my skin color doesn't matter in the jobs that i get i just get what i, you know what I mean the, those kind of people and then suddenly she was kind of awoken to the fact that nah it did play a part before when you were younger you were the cute young mixed race lady now you're older people just look at you as a black lady and you know if there's limited roles for older white ladies imagine how limited the roles are going to be for older black ladies it's just not going to happen so maybe that's just what it is but it's hilarious man it's hilarious to see actors there's nothing worse than seeing people crying on the camera that they turned on themselves because you could just turn it off you don't need to keep crying it's not like someone's recording you you know outside of flipping them out yeah in the real world outside like you can't go away from them and even then you can just slap the camera out of their hand this is your own camera and you can upload this yourself like or you can you can tell someone to cut the stream it's not hard but they still continue to leave it on it's just ridiculous my mum looks like you (laughs) and she who's she talking to bruv it's been very painful to have women that look like my mum. Feel like I'm not representing them. And also, I don't care about this sort of stuff because, again, I'm not a female and I'm not an actor and I don't care about this sort of stuff. But if I did care about this, sort of this, this kind of stuff, I would be a little bit annoyed that she's only speaking up now. Why did you ignore us this whole time? Why do you ignore the nignogs out there? Why did you try and pretend like it didn't matter what your skin color was or, you know, what you'd look like or what you're representing or the fact that maybe you'd, you know, what's that phrase they use in work culture? Um, white passing, right? They say, right? So sometimes they say, oh, if you're mixed race, but you're a fairer complexion or you've got more European features, they, they would tell you that it may be easier for you to get some roles. Who knows? There could be some truth in it. I don't know. Again, I'm not part of that whole scene. But or that industry but if that is the case i would want you to speak up about this sooner i don't want you to now to have suddenly uh which, what's that word called um a, a moral awakening now suddenly because your own roles have dried up because again don't think this is charity this is not her doing something out of the goodness of her heart this is definitely um grounded in the fact that her phone calls have stopped coming in as fast as they were before and now in an effort to try to reposition or repivot her so she's now trying to become what the flipping colorist activist or something it's like come on mate do me a favor but i'm taking from them taking their men <laughs> taking their work <laughs> taking their truth <laughs> taking them i don't know taking them in. i didn't mean to you know Taking their men. What what does Dandy Newton's husband even look like? This is this is a mad one. What's her husband? Is she got a husband? What's what's he look like? Taking their men. Ollie Parker. Old Parker. Oi Parker. Is that Ollie Parker? Eh? I don't know, man. These people are insane. I don't know. Let's just move on, man. Big up Dandy Newton. Auntie's auntie's on a mad one. I don't know what she's doing, man. She's freaking out. She's bugging out right now. 
Then over the weekend, I unsuccessfully attempted to purchase the Jound Babesters, the Baby Nape and Jound Bape Stars, the iconic sneaker model from Bape. And um, yeah, man, no surprise again, just the same old nonsense in it. Like maybe it's because you get, when you get older or when you just start to have more disposable income, these things start to annoy you more because you have the means to buy these things, but you just can't. There is no ability to buy them in like a calm, um, reasonable manner. Everything involves stress. Everything involves elevated heart rate. Everything involves sweaty palms, setting reminders on your phone, different flipping devices to use, a phone on 3G, a laptop on this, a that on that. Like just nonsense games you have to play to get a hold of shoes that you want to pay top dollar for. And if I'm not mistaken, the retail price for these flipping jam babes was like 290 pounds i think in the us it was 320 or three three hundred dollars no for me 300 dollars not cheap clearly not cheap now again i think the whole cheap the whole kind of price argument thing is hard to kind of decipher and go through because we don't really know the cost of the materials they keep they can tell us one thing they can tell us this you know it's tumbled leather and all the seams have been sealed and it's leather late they can tell us whatever but we don't know what the actual cost price of these materials are so whatever whatever the markup is whatever the markup is but then there's also a part of it where it makes me think like I get the feeling some people don't like you talking about prices and how much stuff costs in relation to pricing because somehow it, it doesn't matter when it clearly does especially if you're trying to sell us things a million times throughout the entire year which most sneaker companies do that's the thing it's not like they just drop one special shoe per year they're, they're dropping at least especially all the major brands at least each brand is dropping at least 50 what they would deem to be no, 50 let's say, let's say 20 to be fair at least 20 in a calendar year what they would deem to be special shoes going to like the top kind of boutiques and whatnot the ones that garner the most attention or get the most clicks on hype beats and high sobriety so if that's the case and you keep selling it to us for over 200 dollars how are we meant to have money to afford all of this stuff because even if you say oh cool there's not everyone not everyone is poor not everyone doesn't have a lot of money all right but if you want to appeal to the majority of people majority of sneaker fans who i guess are just regular folk like you or i you're gonna to have to be have to, you're gonna to have to have them priced at a way that they can afford and you're also gonna to have to have them be available in places that they can go and purchase them easily because it's not like people don't have the money to afford them or the ability to go and buy them they just can't do either so you can't go and buy them because they're in limited places or they've been backdoored and you can't pay for them anyway because either the frequency is too close together so sometimes they'll drop a sneak in the middle of the month on a february you don't get paid until the end of the month so you're pissed or you get paid weekly but then you have to splurge your whole week wage on a pair of shoes pissed like or you like just many many things just don't make any sense and it's just stressful it's just annoying it just pisses me off and i don't know what the solution is well i know what the solution is just make more but they refuse to make more and it feels like sneakerheads also enjoy the flipping the the torture they enjoy being miserable they enjoy sharing there's kind of a weird macabre um almost fatalistic thing that people actually enjoy sharing those emails you get from sneakers app saying you didn't get lucky or from end you didn't like there's nothing joyful about waking up logging in signing up for an email address for a raffle that isn't really a raffle because you're having to pay for the shoes anyway like i mentioned a million times and then get an email telling you you can't purchase something that you got money to pay for because why just because like i don't get it any any bit of tech that exists in the world you can purchase if you want to, to to buy a brand new Eames free set, you could go and purchase that right now. You want a piece of art from, you know, Takashi Murakami, you can go get that if you've got the money. You want Daniel Arsham to build you a table. If you've got the money, you can go get that right now. But for some reason, you can get an audience in front of fucking Beyonce if you wanted to. If you've got the money for uh, Beyonce, you could book her to perform at your 16th birthday. But for whatever reason, there's not enough flipping babeses for to supply demand. Like, how does that make any sense? And why is that allowed? Like, why do people kind of permit that? Why do people allow that and don't kick up a fuss? I don't really know why. It's so frustrating. It really, really is, man. And then, all, and then you get all these wild lads sharing pictures of themselves with the shoes that they're probably never going to wear. It's just, oh, just 
drives me nuts, man. They probably are going to wear them. I'm just hating. But you know what I mean. Like, even the embossing on the back of the heel looks fucking sick. I love them. I really, really do. Obviously, the only other solution to kind of make up for this would just go get a pure a pair of pure platinum Air Force Ones, right? That are the same as this, if I'm not mistaken. I think I saw them here on that tweet, right? Is it here? Just get a pair of these. <laughs> and this will make up for not having not having the ability to be able to flip and purchase the babes. That'll be the only thing that'll make them. But again, knowing sneakerheads, they're probably gonna go out and buy these all dead stock and inflate the prices of these artificially because no one's gonna able to get no one was able to get a pair of the babes. That's the annoying part of it. All of it is annoying, you know? That's the kind of original kind of you want. But the only thing that's could give me some solace is that these sneaker brands have been taking such they've been taking a piss out of us so much over the years it feels like they've flooded the scene or the industry or the market with too many shoes and there's not enough people out there to buy them or to wear them and not everything not everything kind of deserves to be in somebody's sneaker collection especially if you want to build something that's a, you want to build up a collection that's somewhat um that might have a high resale value in the future right not every shoe is going to hold their value not every shoe is worth even bothering to collect so because of that the market's oversaturated with shoes you saw it happen a lot with the pattern max ones you know they're incredibly good designed with the ways with the wave mudguard or whatnot but they were only going for a couple of hundred more than the flipping retail and if again if you're somebody that had the disposable income and you just wanted the shoes to wear being able to just sit at home and in the comfort of your own time be able to just buy them when you want for 200 pound more i'll take that all day long so that's the only thing i can see that's a kind of um a silver lining to this um nonsense sneaker culture that exists at the moment where if i check my size on here on StockX, it says listed that the size 11s are 517 right at the moment um in terms of uh, being able to put in a bid so let's say anywhere between 517 and 600 but let's say 517 510 520 that's not too bad if they if they retail that flipping 300 or 290 that's not too shabby to be able to pay 517 and actually get a pair of them now obviously as the time progresses and people start buying more pairs and there's less and less available in the market those sort of prices won't be the same so they might increase or decrease a bit but they'll probably hover around the 400s to the five 600s in that kind of range which isn't too bad if you want to pay for resale but if you don't have the money to afford the resale price again you just missed out on them and that's it which is weird because i think in a way this is essentially the reason why reps are so popular now people complain or sneak it's all your own face it's not the real thing it's like yeah the reason why they're having to do that or even people like myself that wants to go and venture into that world is because i have the money i want to purchase this stuff and i can't buy it legitimately so if i want to purchase the thing and i actually like the shoe for what it is then i'll just go buy the rep i don't have any problem with doing so and i think a lot of people are doing it. i think the people that are doing it now are doing even worse because it's not like they came from a sneaker collection background that i have where i can definitely say i earned my stripes i've done my 100,000 fucking hours queuing outside of stores buying stuff online reselling it swapping this doing that being on forums i've done all that stuff right so if, maybe i could say now okay cool i'm not bothering with doing all the games and retweeting and liking comments so i'd much rather either try to pay the resale or if i can't get the rep but there's now kids coming up who are building their entire sneaker collection off of reps which obviously isn't quote unquote supporting the sneaker industry or the community there is no community because it's just big corporations selling you fucking overpriced sneakers but we move but essentially all of that money is kind of existing outside of the street outside of the whatever streetwear sneaker ecosystem it's going elsewhere and they're probably not engaging as much with us i don't know it just feels like there's there's a there's there's um, loads of different scenes operating at the same time there's a scenes that exist where people are just basically clout demons they're trying to get friendly with people that work in stores they're always begging for discounts they're always thanking their plug on social media there's the people that just want to wear cool shoes to impress girls which is a small group but there is a group that like that exists there's a group out there that only want to wear cool kicks so they can impress other dudes that's a very big group of people i definitely knew those guys coming up there's a group of people that just want to resell and post pictures of them sitting on boxes of jordan ones like there's so many different segmenting groups and that's mostly i feel like because the corporations at the top the big sports brands don't really care about us it's as consumers they're just trying to sell us stuff you know fleece us as much as they can paint everything gold and tell you it's like paint everything in gold paint and let you know and kind of lie to you that it is gold when it clearly isn't 
and just fuck up the entire market, man. It just, honestly, it really did not annoy me this weekend. I shouldn't have been surprised anyway, but it was a real big annoyance. It's like, I've got money ready. I'm ready to go. I don't mind paying your exorbitant flipping shipping prices. Just give me the option to buy it. And still, I couldn't buy it. So again, um, big up these men, innit? Big up these men for just, you know, disappointing me all the time. Um, I shouldn't really be disappointed because I should learn my lesson by now, but it is still annoying to not have the ability to purchase stuff that you clearly have the money to purchase. But, you know, we move in it. We have to move. Next, we've got this kind of sad news courtesy of the New York Times regarding Michael K. Williams, who most of you would know from The Wire. Uh, play the role as Omar. I know him more from uh, Bordal Empire. Um, he was really good in that. If I'm not mistaken, his name on there, I think it was Nucky. Was it Nucky or was it? No, no, it's uh, Chalky White. So that's it. Nucky was the main dude. He was Chalky White in Bordal Empire. But yeah, really tragic death um, that happened. And now it looks like four people have been charged over it, actually. So it's not even just, you know, um, it's not it just being classified as just an unlucky overdose. It, you know, there's something more sinister at play. So it says the following. A Brooklyn man was charged on Wednesday with selling a deadly dose of fentanyl laced heroin to the actor Michael K. Williams, who was best known for the portrayal of the gay stick man Omar Little in the television series The Wire. The man who was charged, Irvin Carter, Carter Jenner, and three others were accused of being part of a drug trafficking crew that continued to sell the drug even after knowing it had killed Mr. K. Williams. Oh my God. But that explains, I remember saying, who says it a lot? I think it's uh, Joe, Joe Diaz, he says it a lot, right? Where he'll make a joke about, oh, I want the weed that killed whatever. I want the, the coke that did, 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 did. And I remember him saying once, oh, that was actually a thing when he used to come up. When he was coming up and he was younger in the scene and he used to do loads of drugs, especially stuff like coke and whatnot. It was actually a known thing that dealers would kind of promote their heroin, you know, their smack, their coke, their crack. Um, they'd promote it as whatever recent celebrity that passed away that was known to get on drugs as well um you know name they'd basically they'd call it whatever who this person that died michael jackson duh, 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 duh. like that's how they promoted stuff like that back in the day which is fucking crazy to think of but um nowadays especially with how lethal small doses of fentanyl are to be that irresponsible to continue selling it that is some sick shit but you continue um operating in broad daylight amid part apartment buildings in brooklyn and manhattan according to a criminal co complaint the sale of fatal doses um, to Mr. Williams in a hand-to-hand -hand transaction in Brooklyn's Williamsburg neighborhood on September the 5th, 2001, was captured on security video, the authority said. This is a public health crisis, Damien Williams, the U.S. attorney for the U.S. Judiciary said, and it has to stop. Deadly opioids like fentanyl and heroin don't care about who you are or what you've accomplished. Michael K. Williams, 54, was found dead in his apartment on September 6. The medical examiner ruled that his death had been caused by acute intoxication by a combined effects of fentanyl, plurifentanyl, heroin and cocaine. The charges against the four men stem from an investigation that began early last year. Before Mr. William died, the complaint said the other men charged, along with Mr. Carter Jenner, were Hector Cruz Robles, 57, Louis Cruz, 56, and Carlos Massey, 70, all from Brooklyn, the government says. That's an old drug crew, isn't it? These are some, these are some steppers for real, isn't it? They be, they, these are like career criminals. 57, 56, 70. Mad. Um, all four were charged, or maybe it's like a thing. Maybe it's like a depending on who your clientele is. Maybe the main crew, when they kind of distribute the drugs, they tell you to go and sell to, or they they allow you to have your own clients. So maybe you buy it kind of like of consignment. Does that make sense? Like you kind of buy it and then you set your own kind of customers. Because I guess if you're an older gentleman that likes to do a bit of heroin on the weekends or after work, the last thing you want to do is pick up from some kid on the BMX when someone that kind of maybe looks like you because it will look less sketchy when you meet on the street. Um, maybe they'll just deal with you a little bit more in a mature manner. I don't know, but it's mad. All four were charged with one count of narcotics conspiracy. Mr. Cardinal was also accused of causing Mr. Davis' death in connection with the conspiracy, a U.S. official says. So, yeah, four people have been charged. Hopefully, some justice is, um, is kind of brought forward um, in order for his you know death to not go in vain. But, yeah, man, the fentanyl thing is fucking crazy. Still remember that crazy story, those comedians. Um, who were getting on it in some hotel room with some coke and stuff I think of the four three of them passed away on that night and only one survived it's like imagine how you'd feel if that you were that one survivor you might feel mad 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 
then we move on to this story courtesy of mix mag which i thought was fairly interesting too called alcohol free zone a clear head on sunday mornings is a gift why djs and ravers are embracing sobriety and obviously it's something that has kind of touched a lot of people especially during the pandemic where people essentially kind of questioning you know why they are doing the things that they do when it comes to drinking and taking drugs and it maybe make people kind of reassess their kind of connection or their relationship with going out and clubs and for the most part from when i've been out anyway i feel like that relationship and that connection with the majority of adults especially in the uk has somewhat severed or people have basically grown out of it or maybe discovered other hobbies that have basically filled that void and i think we're seeing it now clearly on the dance floors where a lot of the places i've been at are hardly full um, and if they are kind of semi full people are way more chill than they were prior even with the extended times of being in lockdown I, I never really felt that people went out and went crazy if anything the craziness happened in the beginning when people were throwing raves in parks and whatnot just trying to escape from the you know from the drudgery of the news every day talking about crazy numbers of people passing away people just went to blackout and kind of forget about the constant reality that they were kind of facing but I feel like clubs have definitely reflected, I wouldn't say sobriety, but say a, a different relationship when it comes to drinking. And there's some really good um, examples here in this article, courtesy of uh, um, this lady, how you pronounce her name? Nyama, Nyama Ingram, explores the benefits of sobriety, can bring for people involved in dance music, in-depth chats with Patrick Turpin, Rebecca, and Radio Slave. So I'll go down. I think, yeah, let's pick a Patrick Turpin. So it says here, uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it says here, Patrick Topin, a uh, producer, DJ, and head of a label and events brand, Trick, isn't teetotal or fully sober, but is an active advocate of sober raving. In the past, he's done two long sober stretches, more than a year, including all of 2018, and more recently abstaining from eight months. Since the UK lockdown ended, each set he's performed has been sober. He says as follows. I went sober for a few reasons, mainly because I was sick of feeling horrific after a night on the drink or on a bender. I had actually started to tarnish the enjoyment of DJing a little bit too, and I was making the prospect of doing a gig seem daunting sometimes, because I knew I was in for a big one and the aftermath that followed. This was against why I got into this in the first place. I should be fully looking forward to going to gigs. Another reason was that I was so, I'm so grateful to be involved with the passion of music as a full-time career, and I wanted to take the, make the most of its opportunity. I think parting gets in the way of being productive and I knew if I wanted to reach my full potential I would have to wind it in considerably and I think that's the most I'll read the, the rest of them but that's probably the most reasonable take out of it I think in general this kind of push for sobriety in dance music is a little bit ridiculous and quite I won't say immature but it's a little bit it kind of doesn't really answer the main question and the actual main question that everyone has to kind of look themselves in the mirror at is actually why do you go out do you go out as an escape from your day-to-day -day hell or do you go out as a kind of excuse to do drugs and drink because a lot of people i feel like fall in the ladder right where they could definitely go out as an excuse to just get on it i know i did in the beginning and i think once you start to go out more regularly and you start to go to different places and you start to experience different parties and different surroundings different crowds different quote-unquote communities and scenes you either you either kind of get a little bit um, disillusioned by it and maybe you want to tap out because there's, there's too many chin strokers and too many people that take themselves too seriously and too many people that wear all black when they go party and whatnot or you fall in love with it and you think you know what I actually want to be a part of this I want to set up my own night I want to be a door person I want to maybe start a security company I want to work in a bar whatever you want to become part of it I want to DJ I want to be an artist blah, 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 blah. Those are the two avenues. And usually when you decide to get involved and kind of work in that industry, slowly but surely you also start to realize that the people that are at the top who you kind of idolize or watch YouTube clips of or follow on social media, they're not getting on it as much as you think they are. You would think every day would be legitimately a party. Every day is like Project X and it's not the case. And unfortunately too, I think it's twofold in that a lot of these people would promote or kind of give out this image that they were doing all those things. I think I mentioned it in the previous podcast about my kind of love hate relationship with Post Malone, The Weeknd and Future with that respect. All three artists I really enjoy. 
but they do perpetuate this kind of image that they're constantly high constantly getting fucked up and we know that isn't the case because we know with people especially becomes the hip-hop kind of adjacent r&b kind of acts for the most part the ones that did get smashed and did get on it really in a really big way are the ones that are no longer with us or whose music has completely suffered but you can't be doing performances on saturday night live and going on conan it wasn't a, um going on Stephen Colbert and doing Super Bowl halftime shows if you're always fucked up on Xanax it just doesn't make any sense because you need to sit down and plan those shows you need to do rehearsals you need to make great music to get on those shows in the first place it just doesn't happen just because you are a party boy that's not the fact at all so you realize that once you get on the inside so that becomes a thing and then when you get on the inside you also start to realize that sometimes balance is better being able to enjoy your night and be able to remember who's playing who played what what the what sets you enjoyed why do you enjoy this bit why this was off why this was on you can only do it if you're somewhat um if your if your senses are not as dulled as they probably would be if you were on drugs and alcohol that's basically what ends up happening and again like i think with the uk it's a difficult one because i think we've always had a very um tumultuous connection or tumultuous relationship with alcohol especially in this country we have a huge problem with that with people just drinking all the way throughout the week i remember that being a big thing that kind of a bit of an eye opener for me when i used to work around the liverpool street area you'd leave work on a monday to a wednesday and people are you know outside of flipping pubs again Thursday to friday it makes more sense because towards the end of the week and you can see people are just wanting to unwind and kind of let loose and get ready for the weekend but sometimes on most weeks you'd see people outside of those pubs monday to friday you know especially weather permitting having a chat catching a bit of, having a bit of booze and most likely that person might have a couple more boozes at home then more on the weekend it's like just crazy crazy amounts which then leads you to not being able to behave adequately when you go out in places and just be a bit of a nuisance which you know might explain why British people in general don't really travel that well when you go we do go on these techno weekenders we tend to be a bit of a liability all these things kind of play into it so if anything again one of the unintended positive consequences of covid is that in the uk it feels like we've suddenly grown up a bit we've kind of figured out how to rave properly even the young even the younger lot i've been to some few younger parties at the moment with kids you know under the age of 25 and whatnot and they are definitely um going for it don't get me wrong but it's not as wild as you would think it would be there's still some level of um trying to be aware of your surroundings and not getting too smashed up so you can you know make sure that you're safe and whatnot i think these are all the important things it continues here said dj uh records founder radio slave aka matt edwards also notes the focus on making music as a motivation of exploring sobriety i remember him saying this a lot on the djs and beers podcast that was really good too i wish they could bring that back but i guess they're all in different places now but djs and beards was really awesome during the entire pandemic basically these four is it four djs or five gathered around spoke on stream about various topics concerning djing and interviewed some of their you know um dj friends or whatnot it was a good insight to kind of see what you know DJs that sort of level talk about day to day it's kind of bullshit but still I think they all came across really well on that anyway um, Radio Slay says as follows I guess like most people I've had moments of sobriety in my adult life and I've tried to being sober a number of times eight years ago I managed almost two years that was brought on by health issues hospitalization having my tonsils removed so I was kind of forced into it this time it's been almost a year I decided I really wanted to clean a break and it could be for a good I have a family small kids and also running red kids requires a huge amount of my time I'm responsible for a lot of artists who need my help and guidance in what is a very difficult business I should add that I'm not against Oh, I'm not, I should also add, I'm not anti-drugs or alcohol. But for me, I feel like I, I know every scenario when it comes to partying. And right now, I'd rather be productive, make music and try to survive this ongoing pandemic, which sometimes feels like a one long hangover, which definitely agree. And that's the thing. If you really want to be productive, you really want to get shit done. There's just no possibility of doing it. Like there are some people that exist out there. You know, I know some of them in the scene who are just freaks, right? They're just mutants. They're able to go out, party, come back, make tunes, make mixes, edits, you know, scour for stuff online, buy records. Like they can actually do the work. Most of us can't. And if that's the case, and you know, you don't have the God given talent and you're having to work hard for first thing, you're having to work hard for things, Ableton and all that sort of stuff isn't coming second, you know, isn't coming at second nature to you. You're having to go over flipping tutorials and read stuff on forums and you're finding everything difficult. Everything, even beat matching is difficult for you. Then you're gonna have to give yourself 
as many um, advantages as possible and one of the best advantages is to obviously clean up your diet clean up your sleep drink loads of water and make sure that you kind of rein in the getting on it because if you're hungover and you have you know and you have a foggy brain for all the drugs you've taken it's just impossible to get work done for the most of us again most of some people out there that have that ricardo lobos gene where they can kind of just get smacked and still do stuff like most of us can't Another person here was Rebecca. She said, my party in which spanned over 15 years was out of control in my end. My life was all a real standstill. I was sneaking drugs behind my then boyfriend's back. Suicidal thoughts plunged me, but still couldn't stop. I suppose deciding to go sober was because of hitting this rock bottom. One that was dwelling in for five years. I was counseling. In, I had counseling, which helped with beating myself up about taking drugs, but it still felt with, it still left me with the person who wanted to take drugs. The habit was still there with no consequence, not even myself who was always torn between wanting to party and wanting to stop the depression and drug taking got worse when i began to wake up on monday morning after a weekend of partying and more often more drugs i knew that this had to stop something clicked i had made some drastic changes i finished with my then boyfriend moved out of our home together and started going to get some help and began my path of recovery literally starting from nothing so this is a bit more of a darker kind of place to be at and again most of these people for whatever reason most of us broken um, souls always find ourselves in that life I don't know what it is about going out that kind of makes us feel somewhat um, content with life and it really makes sense because I know for me I was running away from a lot of things when I was getting on it on a really serious way and getting through flipping three and a half grams of flipping MDMA on a week I mean it was it was absolutely nuts when I was first out going out and then little by little as you start to again engross yourself in things you start to build connections you start to actually want to take part you start to realize that it's not that fun really getting on it all the time it's actually better if you can try and space your sessions out a little bit more or just go out and treat it like a gig it's a bit difficult to do i've done it a few times when i went to fabric it's hard it's a bit of a mind it's a bit of a mind fuck especially if you're staying out past the hours of 3 a.m you kind of want to just have a little pep pep up but mostly if you get past that you're usually plain sailing until then and a good thing also because you're out and you're in a dark place and you're tired by the time you get home you sleep like a flipping angel you sleep, so you sleep like a baby it's really really impressive but it's a hard thing to get over because you know when you go to a gig you usually go to a gig between the hours of like 6 and 10 p.m you don't go between you know 12 a.m and 7 a.m so it's a bit of a mad one but i've definitely enjoyed that side of things going forward like treating my nights out like gigs that's definitely been a big one but like i said i think um i don't know we can yeah, I think that's basically it, but I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can read the whole thing later. But I think in general, I'm I'm more for the uh, Patrick Topin approach of having some level of balance in life. I think that's always important. I think for myself, I gave myself a real big, um, I gave myself a real big pat on the back when I was able to go through a really long sober period. I think it might have been like four months or six months and it happened to coincide with me working for a company where I was basically, basically given a company card. I was allowed to book hotels and flights and I went to Berlin for, I think like a trade show weekend or week or something. And we stayed there for a while. We got invited to this Adidas party where Kano was performing and stuff. And it was absolutely amazing. I think we got given free shoes, if I'm not mistaken. Like one of those kind of PR press kind of like things. Massive queue outside. We got bumped to the front because we knew somebody like really good, really, really good. Like incredible event. You go inside, it's great sound system, great insulation, all this malarkey. And in the bar, they had this wall. So they had the bar where you could just get whatever, you know, hot mixer you wanted in terms of liquor, in terms of, yeah, what you wanted for the menu and then they had this wall that had basically wall-to-wall -wall fridges full of flipping um heineken in their bottles all chilled because again that's something that you don't we take for granted or we don't do in the uk a lot um you go to raves and the drinks aren't even cold but you go to foreign countries especially in central europe especially places like flipping um but it's basically like Germany, I won't say it's just Central Europe, but you know what I mean. Um, usually in those places, like, you know, even dive bars have got flipping um, mug, uh, big mugs with flipping that are chilled. They can kind of drink out of one and have an actually nice beverage or nice drink with. And I remember being in there and they had water wall kind of fridges that you could just basically take a, a, a drink out of and just enjoy it. And I was able to be sober for that entire period. And again, this is with the company card, so everything's going to be comped. Um, expenses everything's covered in that regard you can claim that back later so it's definitely the place to kind of indulge because it mean all the money that you have spare will just go on drugs really and you can just do what you want because you get all free drinks but i was able to be completely sober that whole time again in the heart of flipping berlin 
with all the best clubs around. I even went to Bergheim completely sober too. That was a bit of a trip and I enjoyed it. I'm not going to lie. And I think that's when I realized, okay, cool. I'm not really going to these places to escape. I'm going to these places because I enjoy going to these places and I enjoy seeing people like that i kind of listened to their mixes or heard their productions or bought their tunes play live i enjoyed the seeing different elements of the scene seeing the architecture the interior blah 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 all these things that i'm really really interested in um and you know there's no better way to experience that kind of thing than being somewhat sober again it's difficult to do not everyone can do it don't feel like you are a failure if you can't but I do kind of do feel like your raving experience will be improved if you have the ability to be able to do both. You can go out sober and you can go out getting on it too. It'll make kind of your nights out a little bit better because that will mean also that you're not kind of peaking too early. That's something that I used to do on the regular basis, especially when I used to go out because again, I'd, I'd be treating going out as an escape and not actually going out as an enjoyment. So something has definitely kind of developed over the last couple of years really during the pandemic. So yeah, check out this article. Um, the name of it is a clear head on a Sunday morning is a gift. Um, why DJs and ravers are embracing sobriety. I'll actually post it in the. I'll put it in the description when I upload the clip or whatever, or I'll put it in the description of the podcast so you can check it out if you're interested. Because I think it's a really really good one. I think it's a really good one. Um, next on the list here, let's talk about this one. This this one's a good one. So let's talk about Dias. There's this pretty cool, let me see what I say. There's this pretty cool interview that I've just stumbled across on YouTube, courtesy yeah of a channel called Warp Magazine, featuring none other than DVS One, who a lot of you will know as being a supremely talented DJ and somebody who talks very eloquently and very well about dance music and everything pertaining to it. And you know he's a little bit pretentious, he's a little bit up his own ass, but I like it especially in a sea full of people not taking the art form seriously not approaching their set seriously not digging for tunes not buying stuff just begging their fans to send them demos that they can play off rip and not really just being invested in it in any way shape or form or just using it as an excuse to get drugs or to fuck chicks it's nice to see an artist or a dj who really thinks deeply about their work who cares a lot and who tries to somewhat have some form of artistic expression through tracks that they don't even make because that's always people's common sort of like pushback when it comes to dj and being artists right for the most part you're playing other people's music but there is a diff that we've all been to, we've all been out and been somewhere where someone played a terrible set and we've also been out in some places where someone's played a set you don't even kind of get your head wrapped around it and usually in those places with, with kind of small exceptions or few exceptions they're usually playing music that you can get a hold of yourself from like you know boom cat or juno or hard wax or whatever or phonica there are tunes that are readily available but they've somehow been able to sequence it and mix it in a way that has kind of brought life to stuff that you maybe have listened to prior whether it's kind of pitching it up pitching it down removing the mid treble bass like crazy stuff they can do just manipulate that'll make it sound completely different than what you've heard in your own bedroom i know it's happened to me plenty of times right you listen to a flipping dixon set you get a tune that you want to buy and then you go and buy it and it sounds nothing like what he played out and then you realize oh yeah he's doing edits he's pitching it down he's slowing it up he's only looping this bit when he's mixing it like just crazy stuff happens all the time so i like um whenever dvs1 kind of speaks about stuff concerning about the scene and whatnot and i think this one clip here he speaks about the fast techno hype and why he feels like it just is a bit of hype and sooner rather than later it will end and um it's an, it's an interesting perspective on it because i think at the moment it does feel like for me i think even last year because um i'm actually looking it's what i'm looking forward to going to possessions so i'm going to go to possession party here in the uk hopefully i think it's the 18th of february and then there's going to be a festival in paris that hopefully i can go to as well that's going to be happening on sometime in august i think or something like that and i want to see what this hard fast techno sounds like in that environment because i feel like though that crew possession are a bet the best representation of that entire scene of these young kids coming up playing this kind of euro trash hard dance hard techno sort of stuff kind of you know ebm influence kind of stuff sort of music i want to see it in its actual natural habitat and see if i can kind of vibe with it because so far when you listen to those kind of things on a boiler room or on a horror um, how you pronounce that station's name or whatever else it don't really it doesn't come through the screen for me personally it doesn't really come through the screen and nothing i noticed too there's not a lot of groove there's not a lot of bop to it it's just like 
everything's 145 plus and it just kind of slaps into it to each other it's just like noise da, 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 da. you know it kind of reminds you it kind of reminds you of two really fast trains going past each other like, whew, whew. I mean, there's no synch- there's no synchronicity between them. It's just these two big beasts moving at breakneck speed, just going past each other really, really fast, and that's about it. Um, there's no blend. There's no kind of weaving in between each other. No notes floating above them. It's just nothing. It's just kind of just two trains hurting in all opposite directions, trying their best not to swear on the other side to clang. That's it. But there's no groove whatsoever. And I think DVS One kind of speaks about it really eloquently here in this video. I think it's 9.25 in it, so let's put it up on the screen. The the most uh, safe answer I can give you without throwing anything under the bus, because I have my own personal opinions, but my personal opinions, are, I'm going to say, are mine. Pure House and Techno has survived every hype. And, and right now, just like five years ago, like 10 years ago, like 20 years ago, hypes come. And hypes come, and they go. And they come, and they go. And from every hype, you get 5% that are authentic in that hype and they will survive that hype. And then the other 95%, they move to the next hype when it happens. And right now in techno, we're in a moment of hype for fast, how fast? Everyone wants to go faster than fast, (laughs) but they're losing groove by going that fast. They're losing a little bit. Now there's some very good artists in that hype right now and they will survive it, but that hype will slow down at some point. And people get tired, people grow up, people move on, and another hype will take its place. So for me, as much as I'm aware of the things that come and go, I try not to pay attention to them because it's not gonna change my style. It's not gonna change what I play or who I am. And maybe I'll find a cool record that'll sound good slowed down just a little bit. And when things were really slow, I found slow records that would sound really good sped up. So. I just look at it as if it's good music or not good music in my personal taste, then it's interesting to me. But um, I'm happy to see new things coming. I'm happy to see new artists evolve and develop. Um, And I'll be happy to see uh, certain trends slow down a little bit. Yeah, the old man boom and him came out at the end. But I do agree with his thoughts. I think it's impossible to see that scene and not smile. It's impossible to see like these kids at this boiler room sets. I've got one here on screen, right? This is a possession set. Let's get the sound a bit low on here so it's not going to blare and pop your ears open. And this is Barfe playing at um, Boiler Room London possession party. It feels like, is it Boiler Room London or is it somewhere else? Yeah, Boiler Room Festival, London, right? It's impossible to see this stuff and not get and not feel somewhat kind of happy for the kids, right? That they've got their own sort of thing going on. They don't need to kind of go to all the old fogey things they don't have to because i think when i was coming up you had to just basically there was no younger generation stuff or there was no kind of younger generation heroes to kind of look up to in a dj booth everyone was basically your dad's age or something you had to be forced to basically enjoy whereas it feels like these kids coming up have people who are their age who are look like they look like them look like they're in the same look like they're into the same things they're into um hang out at the same places you know being able to ascend to this level of fame and notoriety playing this really really specific type of music so it's hard not to like that sort of stuff but in terms of just like sonically it's not the best is it it's not really that great but But I really want to see this stuff in live, live in concert, you know, um, around the people that actually have made it really popular. I think position over the last three or four years of, you know, really kind of, I think, taken outdoor sort of rave production to a whole nother level. You know, the, the frequency that they were putting on events during the pandemic was just crazy. Like it felt like every other weekend they were putting on these massive events with like 4,000 kids in the middle of some Parisian flipping warehouse somewhere outside of the main kind of spot or the main center of Paris. Just really, really crazy. I think it's on the outskirts usually they do it, isn't it? Really insane, which I'm assuming is because of noise pollution and police trouble and whatnot and maybe licenses, but they do it really, really well. But for me, I feel like the artists are quite samey. I feel like the tracks are all the same. For what was that one track where everyone kept playing? Was it like a fucking Fergie record or something? Remember, there was some remix or some Britney Spears that everyone was playing in that scene for a good, like, it felt like a good four months. Everyone was playing this one edit of, like, I think it was Fergie. If it wasn't Fergie, it might have been 
uh, I don't know, one of those people that they had a, there was some sort of edit that they made. It was just like oh, enough already with this kind of pop mashup sort of stuff. It just gets a bit cringe. But again, I'm happy for the kids. Good look, glad they've got their thing going on. But I am just to see what the next evolution will be because naturally this will get a bit sharper, a bit tighter. They, they will kind of improve their output and there'll be more there'll be probably a more variety of artists stuff will start to splinter a bit in terms of the scene people will start to get into other things in terms of what they want to play out and whatnot i think it will really really evolve i think so going forward but let me just get rid of this see now it's not doing that is it for me i don't know why it's doing that yeah i think that's done right let's get this up here again i've got to change this because for whatever reason now it's not letting me flip in edit it without having to move all this stuff around but damn it that's annoying isn't it okay let's see if i can change this without having to move this around too tough um because for whatever reason my obs has crashed on me and it's not allowing me to just change things on the whim it's making it hard uh let's move on to this one let's go in here let's do this let's do this Let's go, let's go here. Let's just go here. Let's go here. Yeah, let's do this one. Let's play this. Let's hopefully this plays and doesn't treat me like crap. Why isn't it not oh, why is it not switching now? Come on. There we go. Now it's switching. Okay, switching now. Okay, you gonna switch now? Cool. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so now we're in a move. We're in a move now. Back back to back to some semblance of normality. So obviously most of you are aware what's going on with Joe Rogan. He's going through a bit of a hell, um, hellish situation at the moment where, you know, if it wasn't enough that they were trying to consistently and frequently cancel him because of his alternative or somewhat um, fringe views, which are now largely accepted regarding COVID and regarding maybe alternative medication um, or alternative approaches to dealing with COVID in terms of ivermectin and all this kind of blah, blah, blah. You know, the normal stuff is going on over there. Now it seems like they've kind of decided that, you know, they, if that didn't get him out of there, they want to now paint him as a racist. So this video compilation has gone around of, you know, um, Joe Rogan basically dropping mad M-bombs on his um, podcast. So much so that a tracker that someone made which basically kept a log of all the Joe Rogan shows on the archive and basically was able to kind of tally up the ones that went missing. I think initially when Joe Rogan episode, um, podcast ported over to spotify 40 immediately weren't available and i think at the time Joe Rogan never explained it but basically what we were heard later on down the line was that for spotify didn't want those episodes but in the last few weeks or the last couple of days Joe Rogan has now deleted 70 more episodes that basically featured him maybe saying the n-word in a very flagrant and obtuse way and um yeah which is quite a nuts approach but it seems like everyone's coming after him and they obviously want to cancel him but a really funny interesting video came up Funny, interesting video. Does that even make sense? An interesting video came up that basically features um, one Joey Diaz and Milo Yiannopoulos, right? Yiannopoulos, however you say his name, basically predicting some of what's been occurring with Joe Rogan, especially in Milo's case. I think Joey, first of all, is kind of, you know, teasing Joe Joe, Joe Rogan because he first had to his first kind of apology for maybe speaking out of side of his mouth about something I forgot what the actual reason was but Joe Diaz was kind of poking fun basically saying that look at our guy look at how much he's changed now since he's had the cash in that Spotify check it's not all rainbows and unicorns you're now responsible and you now basically you basically have bosses that you basically have to report to in some way shape or form and I think these videos are very um funny to look back on considering everything that's happened with joe rogan within the last couple of days and whatnot but let's kind of play it quickly and we can jump on to some other things once we've done that whoops let me get this make sure it's zoomed in a bit more yep zoomed in right yep zoomed in there let's play this joe rogan and milo basically poking fun at joe, T at joe rogan <laughs> i love this clip Joe Rogan, he put the apology up. They would tell him, go record. Yeah. He, he was, that's hard for my dog. Yeah. My heart goes out to him. He had to put an apology up and shit. I guess he. Things look good when he was, things look good in the basement, dog. <laughs> Once you take that Spotify money, <laughs> you got to start apologizing <laughs> and make him believe you care about trannies and stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now he's got to go to a tranny parade and donate $10 every month. <laughs> go play it. Any day now, you'll see Rogan hanging out with trannies down in Austin, jumping up and down. 
you know, the poor guy. That's what happens when you get that money. When you cash that big check, you got to watch what you say. Aren't you lucky you're independent now? You guys were upset for a couple weeks. Uh, nobody wants to give us any money. Did you see him? He's got to do the apology. My name is Joe Rogan. I don't kill. I can't go kill deer no more. He can't do nothing no more. A hundred million. Uh, <laughs> oh, Joey. Joey. Uh. Uh, All right. Okay, let me unlock yeah. a mystery for you. Nothing that you say specifically on any subject. There's no one utterance. We're we're bred to believe that people kind of uh, kill their careers because they, oh, he misspoke. He made a joke. That we, no, this only happens when somebody's already in the sights. Somebody's yes. already. Yeah, Joe, Joe, Joe Rogan, for instance, is one of the next big ones to fall. He's one of the next ones on the, on the chopping block. And they're going to come to come for him uh, for sort of enabling and giving a platform to the extreme right. Yeah. Now, Joe has a lot of legitimate... That started already. You see well, like Joe the whispers has... of it. He right. just ignores it. He doesn't really acknowledge well, it. Well, he ignores it for as long as he can for, for now. But, I mean, he has a lot, lot of legitimately A-list friends. So, so not you, but... but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know. It's you're, okay. You're, you're, good, you're, good. you're lovely. But um, he does have some, like, legit A-list friends. And he's also represented by top rank um uh, talent agencies and all the rest of it this is all going to go away within the next six months oh. this is all happening within within you know the next six months because he's going to be you he's thing. going to be presented as an, you should promise sure. uh he's going to be presented as an example of somebody who has enabled or given a platform to the alt-right whatever the fuck that is uh you know the, okay so I happen to know who's in the crosshairs because I know a lot of the people who orchestrate this stuff. Well, it takes and a while. That's why, though, right? Why not, what? It is. It's orchestrated, and it also takes a while. It's we heard just, about it's um, just Aziz. But it's funded. It's funded and orchestrated. As soon as, as, soon as about... Yeah, just to back up, by the way, what as, Lewis is saying, I remember hearing about that Louis was going to oh, get... Louis well, that Louis was going to get written mm -hmm. up like months before the right. New York Times piece came out and Aziz, is, like Aziz months Aziz before too. the Aziz thing Aziz came out. TJ, I both of those things before. And I, 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 can name another, I don't want to name another so, comic. Neither, I, it didn't I, know another, I know another comic. It's coming. Big name, clean comic that's coming that I've been hearing Dude, for don't like don't do it. So you, Cosby. He's going down, people. Squeaky clean, but don't let that fool you. Sell your stock. <laughs> so you guys haven't heard this yet about him. You probably will in about two months, and then in about four months after that, it'll happen. Now, um, wow. the problem with, with, with him is he's actually big enough and strong enough and famous enough and powerful enough to ride it out. Yep. But he's chosen not to. And if you look at the... What do you mean he's chosen not to do what? Well, look at, the, look at the choice of guests in the last six months. I mean, the guy used to have, you know, me, Gavin McGuinness, and he used to have interesting people. And now he's retreated. Just and Ari. Just, now he's, well, now he just has you and... I mean, you don't even fight, you know? It's like, it's like, 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 yeah. I like you. Yeah, you got to pay a win. He had, he had no. Malice on a exactly, week ago. Ex exactly. He, had, he still has, he has Ben Shapiro and... Um, uh, and Jordan Peterson. These are the safest of the safe. Well, and Jones, Alex like, Jones, he just had on again. Probably Alex got... Jones is a cartoon character. I yeah. love Alex, and it's I know me. Alex personally, and off-camera and on-camera, Alex is the same person, all the rest of it. But as far as the media is concerned, he's a cartoon character. So, yeah, you, you get a drift there. So I guess they were fairly, um, fairly right in their predictions going on about that. Next, let's move on with that one. I'm going to talk about quickly with this concerning some of the comments from some of the Joe Rogan uh, supporters out there who have now who have now decided, I guess, to ban around and, you know, stand up for him and back him up by posting pictures of themselves with him. Like, he's, so they're acting as if he died. I mean, like, he died in some horrible car, car crash, you know, which didn't happen, touch wood. The guy's alive. He just dropped too many M-bombs and compared black people to apes when you go into watch Planet of the Apes in a fairly densely black populated area somewhere. Do you know what I mean? It was just like, oh, mate, that, that story about him watching Planet of the Apes was actually worse than the actual N-word bomb. I swear on my life it was. Like, that was actually much worse. I really, really do think it was. But maybe people will kind of disagree. But anyway, regardless, um, let me get off of the screen. I got it ready. So everyone's banding around. Everyone's basically trying to, um, you know, uh, pay tribute in their some in their what in one way or the other by basically letting it be known that they're gonna stand up for their friend in a way to kind of push back against cancel culture and whatnot and censorship, blah 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 blah. But on paper, when you actually look at it, it does actually look quite ridiculous, right? There are these comics that are kind of banding around trying to 
protect somebody or stand up for someone that essentially used a word that they should not use in any circumstance and used it in a very derogatory way or used you know connotations describing black people as monkeys in a very dis described in, in a very derogatory way in one instance right i can't even speak too well at the moment too much green juice but you get what i mean you get what i mean i thought all the support was you know fairly innocent and kind of made some sense in terms of people just wanting to be there for him because they felt like maybe he was there for them during their kind of darkest deepest moments but one that kind of stuck out to me that i thought was a little bit cringe was whitney cummings and the reason why i say whitney cummings was cringe because as most of you would know she was somebody who i felt like handled the crystalia and brian callen cancellations very poorly even though they had nothing to do with her she was not she was no she, she wasn't there flipping she's laying maxwell she wasn't rounding up these young girls allegedly to be you know whatever you know uh for these supposed comics or whoever i'm talking about she wasn't doing that clearly but she also was one of both of their friends right she knew both of them really well especially in crystal lee in terms of professional relationship or professional relationship that they had working together on that show whitney and other things they'd done before in the past um so you would have thought it would have been a good opportunity for maybe to her to talk about i don't know how difficult it is to be a woman in entertainment industry to navigate that scene um you know how she's basically had to kind of come to some sort of realization of maybe the place the part that she has maybe inadvertently played by enabling or standing next to somebody that she maybe never spoke up about before because they were friends i don't know there's a way that you could spin it where you don't need to look like you're burying your friend or throwing them under the bus too obviously you are essentially you basically are throwing them under the bus but you can do it in a way that seems tactful because clearly she's got her own career to protect and no one's saying she just bury her own career for the sake of some random dude no but also it's not a random dude is it it's somebody that you would kind of deem to be a friend somebody who they kind of had really interesting introspective conversations on their podcast clearly somebody she had a lot of respect for or admiration for in terms of his comedy and it's suddenly out of the blue he gets one accusation which i don't think was a shock to a lot of people in that scene because you know i don't think you can hang out with somebody at night doing comedy and not see the things that they are into whether it's dark stuff or normal stuff you just you know you may be not gonna not gonna say anything because it's not your business but to suggest that it just is all of a shock and they never knew anything i really don't believe it but again this is just me talking on my ass i've got no information about that sort of stuff i don't know what's going on there i live in england i don't want any smoke leave me alone but this is kind of a series of tweets that Whitney Cummings put up regarding some of her defense when it comes to Rogan. And in all of these defenses, I think with the exception of maybe one, I don't think she even mentions his name, which again goes to show the lack of kind of spine that people like this have in it. So you're trying to defend somebody publicly for something I don't think you should be defending someone for anyway. You know, oh, okay, okay, here's one. There's one of them. But again, it's not really a defense. It's more so just speaking kind of vaguely open ended about the situation. So. It's not even like she's coming out and actually saying it with her chest. She's just kind of meekly kind of declaring some sort of allegiance to not look like um, she's not speaking up, you know, in the midst of her comedic peers. But one tweet reads as follows. If you wanted real change, you'd be focused on elections, not taking place on Tuesday instead of a comedian who wears spacesuits on, on, uh, on some of his episodes jokes. So clearly, again, um, <laughs> minimizing something a lot of people feel really... Uh, to take me seriously i guess i've kind of made my position clear in terms of what i feel about the whole situation i don't necessarily care about it too much um i was aware of the clips beforehand um when i first started listening to rogan i was also kind of aware of how edgy and sort of out there some of the early podcasts were i took them into my strides the one that i didn't like i just skipped i didn't really have that much of an issue with it and again i don't really think those comments are reflective of him as a character i don't think they kind of are in uh an inkling or a window into his psyche that he might be a secret racist i don't think that's the case at all um it might be an oath he might be a bit of a dimwit um again that plenty of story was flipping crazy but i don't think it's that deep personally but again in the states that sort of stuff doesn't run the same um they're a lot more sensitive to those kind of words um maybe joe rogan's got a different sort of appeal to people out there maybe they associate it more with people that are you would say are what right wing or people that may be white nationalists so maybe it kind of conjures up some different sort of emotions 
So to hear somebody or to see somebody like Whitney Cummings, white as snow, pale as snow, right? White as fuck, basically telling you that you shouldn't be taking what he says seriously, even though it's definitely serious for you. That's a little bit demeaning, right? <laughs> that's a little bit demeaning, a little bit dismissive. And clearly some black woman here in the comments called um, Francesca Ramsey, and no idea who she is. I'm pretty sure she probably does something in the entertainment industry, decided to give a bit of a read instead of following. People are multifaceted. They can care about multiple things at once. The same way your tweet doesn't mean you don't care about a bunch of other things that said as a white woman it's fucked up to chime in on how black folks should feel about the n-word regardless of if they called jokes or nah maybe sit this one out and then of course that tweet got deleted which is why i took the screenshots because i knew you know someone like this doesn't really have a spine or anything so she's definitely going to go through and delete stuff another one she posted comedians don't need to sign up to be your hero it's your job to be irreverent dangerous to question authority and take you through a spooky mental haunted house so you can arrive at your own conclusion stay focused on the people we pay taxes to be moral leaders this woman's on the trip you would imagine this is coming from some sort of, I don't know, intellectual or something. But no, she's just meant to be a stand-up comedian. So you would imagine maybe, I don't know, make a joke out of it, you know, tease people, I don't know, poke fun at it. Nah, let's just, let's just speak about ourselves as what dangerous, irreverent, you know, thought thinkers and stuff like thought leaders like no you're not and clearly uh, mark Marin echoed those thoughts with his reply at the bottom said maybe add to be funny to the list which is a nice little burn there he's always had a bit of a, a weird relationship with rogan it feels like i don't know if it's love hate or hate love but you know they always have a bit of a tumultuous relationship and he's also somebody that doesn't really adhere to the whole cancel culture they're trying to suppress our views and censorship thing because he feels like i think you mentioned in a show once that basically everyone that's been censored has gone on to make millions and millions of dollars so it's not as if censorship isn't good for business it's actually the best sort of marketing tool actually going out saying something crazy in the hope that it can get you cancelled quote unquote so that you could use that to leverage yourself into other deals and other streams of revenue or whatnot or bigger gigs or bigger fees whatnot or whatever it may be i just thought that was a good little burn and then the other one was don't look to why so many people trust rogan look to why so few people trust the mainstream media again in middle of the road vague open-ended comments of support not really saying anything trying to say something again loads of words without saying anything in the hope that she doesn't basically come out of it looking too bad again mostly protecting herself in this regard which again you know we shouldn't be too surprised considering how um limp-wristed that she was when it came to standing up or defending uh chris lee and uh brian callan who i'd imagine are probably smiling and chuckling at themselves in bed now at the moment considering what rogan's having to go through in it that they had to basically stomach the entire to you know, this situation on their own without having any real um help or support from anybody really for the most part apart from Shaw, who you know imagine that being your support system not the best in the world i'd imagine another one which i thought was pretty funny in terms of um support for rogan was uh andrew schultz came out with a very interesting tweet which i think inadvertently started this whole trend of comedians posting pictures of themselves with rogan like he died or something which is not dead <clears throat> sorry touch wood wow the burp there's too much there but he's not dead the guy's perfectly fine he just said too many n-words in too many podcasts maybe over a 70 maybe more who knows and basically compared black people to monkeys right so you know not the best but again not that serious but still he's not dead let's relax but this tweet i think from shoals basically spooked everybody into looking through their flipping iphones to find a picture especially oh i have noticed whenever someone wants to prove that they're friends with somebody the one thing that they always try to do is always grab a photo of the person there you know that's obviously in the public eye um or that's kind of the talk of the town at the moment try and pick as old the pictures they can not too old so it's not too you know you're not you're not sucking yourself off too much but it's old enough to prove that you knew them before they got too too famous and everyone done the same thing they're always posting all these kind of old clips it's fucking annoying these grown men flipping look i stand with my friend who said the n-word too much just like relax like just just even make a joke about it or just move on it's not that serious really everyone will forget about this next week it's not that big but anyway shot said the following he said rogan has made a lot of people millionaires imagine being one of those people and staying silent right now because this will blow over in a month but that silence will never be forgotten you know it'll never be forgotten andrew schultz <laughs> you deciding to throw a wedding in la <laughs> not inviting any of your new york comedian friends and for some reason inviting fucking brendan Shaw. <laughs> like what 
why did all those guys that he kind of started up with in some way shape or form in new york not get invited to the wedding why wasn't the wedding in a neutral venue why wasn't many things happening Th those are things that people won't forget that was really weird that was something that i kind of couldn't get my head around also no one will forget remember that um microphone company that they tried to use remember there was a big deal they were launching their podcast with flagrant two which again i'm a big fan of but they tried to launch their podcast with some new audio microphone pickup thing that didn't need to use conventional mics so they could just have it all pick up from around the room and you know clearly it didn't work and um they never really spoke about it again they just kind of pretended like it didn't happen those are things people never forget but this stuff is just so cringe if it was already cringe enough as it is that everyone kind of treats Rogan like a deity and they don't really pull him up on stuff, they don't poke fun at him, they don't tease him on his show, they just kind of go on there and kind of pray tribute and kiss his ass and whatnot, which I don't think really makes for a good show. I think the ones that are actually better are the ones with Ari on them, who again is the comedic equivalent to flipping Marmite, but at least he pushes back a bit, at least he kind of pokes fun at him, at least he tries to have a bit of banter so that he actually makes for a better show. And if from what I've seen, especially with this new show they've got up with the lineup with Shane Gillis, Mark Norman and um, Ari Shafir. For the most part, I don't think I've ever seen Rogan look that happy on a show before. He's loving it because these are free comedians who love, love to shit talk, love to joke around, one-liners all over the place, especially when it comes to Mark. And it's way more fun because they don't, take him as seriously in that environment they're all getting shit faced drunk and stuff talking about random things trying to make each other laugh which is obviously then they're obviously trying to push the line in terms of what is allowed to say maybe cutting out things like just really fun and loose environment kind of maybe the equivalent of what you'd imagine they'd be like if they're just shooting a shit in a bar themselves together right with no cameras around and that's usually the best version of Rogan because he's around people who are not taking him too seriously but whenever all these kind of guys get around and it starts sucking him off I just feel like ugh it's so cringe i get why don't get me wrong he's the biggest thing since slight spread especially over there and entertainment wise and i'm sure people have gone on there and gone from having 10 followers to having 17 million or something along those kind of lines have been able to change their lives completely through just one appearance on their book sales appearances have gone up like everything kind of goes up from there but still man this is really weird if when you look at it from in context too because this isn't like he is getting cancelled for having the wrong opinion on transgender athletes or for not wanting to you know maybe having some non-conventional views when it comes to plant parenthood no this is just him saying too many n-words on the podcast and again you know correlating black people with monkeys like this is what you said it is what it is i don't care it's not that big of a deal but let's not pretend like it's some oh he can't say things censorship it's like yeah you're, you can't just go around if you're a white guy dropping end bombs all over the place that's just not the way to go and do things i'm sorry i i wish we could live in a world that that was permitted right or do we or do we do we really want to live in a world where you you just walk into a flipping pub and what you know flipping greg behind the bar says yo what's up my nigga do you really want that is that what you really want i don't i know i don't mate i'd much rather don't and again that word doesn't really offend me as much as it does other people but i still don't want my flipping bartender calling me that when i'm going to go order a flipping heineken you know what i mean i'd rather not i'd rather not that happen but again you know these guys have to do this thing it's part of the whole dance they do to show that they're you know they're worthy of the show and maybe it's another way to kind of suck rogan off so in case so if he does survive this on spotify you've then got the ability to jump back on the show and basically be able to scold everyone that didn't support him publicly like this it's just really gay it really is man like yuck 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 and i'd imagine in some respects if you're rogan maybe you feel like your apology was fairly decent like, i don't think i don't think the apology was all right i think there were parts of it where he it was kind of gaslighty where he was trying to basically say but he, he said it and he said it and they said it and basically threw quentin tarantino under the bus quentin tarantino does movie he says it all the time it's like relax we're talking about you don't get other people involved i always hate people do that so this it was a bit gaslighty but in general i thought it was a fairly decent apology he basically you know kind of tried to explain himself without giving himself excuses basically apologized profusely and said he was dumb to say it. it's a regrettable thing he regrets every single day something da, 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 and he's going to try and do better for next i don't know i thought it was fairly decent so maybe if you're joe rogan you probably don't want your friends to make more of a meal out of it because they're essentially they're kind of undoing your good work because essentially them protesting and trying to make it seem as if it's like an anti-censorship thing 
is taken away from the context of what you said. I mean, it's just, that's what it is. But I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it when it comes to that thing. But I love uh, Bridget um, Petsy's um, reply at the bottom. Just here to say that I feel pretty insecure about not being a millionaire right now. I love that whole stuff. But yeah, um, interesting way to kind of go about showing your loyalty to one man. But I guess, you know, industry shit, in it? Industry shit. And then the last one that was really funny in terms of support for Rogan was fucking none other than the one of the most um heavily requested guests when it comes to JRE decided to kind of throw his hat in the ring in there and show um how much of a fanboy he is of Rogan or how much he owes his career to Rogan too to come on and say because I was thinking about it now actually the ones that have kind of gone out and really dug deep into their archives of pictures of them together with Rogan to show how much how close they are in terms of friends are also the people who for the most part have to thank huge have to thank rogan for basically making their career maybe 70 percent of their career is basically being made because of their allegiance or proximity to rogan and that whole comedy store scene at la scene i think so if you think about it from the people that have kind of uploaded this stuff from the birds to the toms to gurus to the irish affairs to mark norman even like once they got on rogan that put their career up to the stratosphere so where they can maybe take it full time where they can maybe buy a house you know propose to their partners and whatnot like that really changed their lives in a meaningful way so maybe we shouldn't be too surprised that they're going above and beyond to flip and get on their knees and suck him off but it's still cringe to see adults do this it's, it, it would never not be cringe to me and there's nothing worse i feel like on social media nothing worse maybe this is only second to people who record videos who record themselves crying online that maybe is number one as a pet peeve or something i just don't can't get my head around or maybe is an illustration of mental illness another form of illustration of mental illness i feel is people who screenshot their own tweets and share them on instagram like hey guys i got this off on instagram and it went it did crazy numbers so i'm going to post this here now or the people that crop their tweet post on instagram but make sure to include the analytics or the sorry the metrics right the the kind of the likes the retweets and comments and shit because it's crazy high like there's nothing worse than that no one cares about your tweets on instagram i know i don't i want to go in there and see pretty pictures of cool videos i don't want to see your words your declarations or whatnot like piss off if i want to see them i'll go follow you on twitter and if I'm not following you on this, because I don't want to hear your words. Like, it's just as simple as that. But anyway, Brendan wanted to kind of go and pay tribute and say the following. I'll do yen yeah, because I'm sure Shane Gilles' original tweet said as follows. Rogan is a man. If they cancel him, just end your Spotify subscription. Which is an odd thing to say, because it's essentially doing the same thing that you feel like Spotify doing to Rogan, right? Rogan's, if Spotify silenced Rogan, you're all going to, what, boycott Spotify because they don't let him say the N-word on his show. What? all right cool but anyway brendan show this is the following i'll do your one better at shane gillis which is funny because shane gillis is definitely somebody that um you would say is a fan of the homeless cat so for him to kind of go out of his way to align himself like hey comedy guy comedy friend hey buddy hey peer is hilarious because he doesn't i don't think have any time for him as a comedian at all but you know that maybe it's me interpreting too much into it but he says yeah i'll do you one better shane gillis if they cancel joe rogan every comic rogan has ever helped should pull their podcast or spotify i'm down it's funny he said podcast he didn't say special because obviously you know he's just got that one showtime special that is 1.7 <laughs> and also who cares like who cares about your fucking podcast on spotify who really gives a shit especially the ones that are up there for free because part of the reason why they signed the rogan on there or they paid for all those other ones is to get all those other shows on board part of the reason why you'd pay rogan 100 plus million is so that all these friends that have podcasts might want to go on there too to jump on the wave that all the comedians podcasts are on spotify as well like that might be part of it or they might come to spotify and be willing to take worse terms so that they can have that allegiance or they can put that graphic up that they are in partnership with spotify loads of things kind of tie into it but if you've just got a show and you're uploading it on there for free like i am i've just got a feed that basically sends it to apple sends it to spotify taking it off on there in protest does nothing like they don't give a shit do you do, like do, do do you want to i would hate to imagine how many flipping do, not dormant but how many like weekly streams people like you know legacy acts get on spotify on a daily basis that like, keep the lights on there do you really think they're going to care about a couple of king of the sting episodes and the fire and the kid like come on do yourself a favor mate i mean do yourself a favor like what the hell does that even mean like i'll take my podcast off no one cares 
And again, it goes to if I, in my opinion, I think it does Joe Rogan's apology more harm than good. He actually did a pretty decent apology. I thought he explained himself pretty well. Um, you know, a bit gaslighting in past, like I mentioned before, but he did a good job in terms of you know, basically painting or putting out what his position is at the moment, being kind of regretful and remorseful about the situation, and basically apologizing profusely, trying to explain it without trying to excuse it and that's it we move on then people can do with that apology what they want to do with it whether they accept it or whether they say it's not enough and it should be burned at the stake but that was okay then to get all your friends to come up and basically decry censorship there's this is fascism it's like no nah, mate you just you're not allowed to jump on your podcast and say fucking n-words you know over 70 episodes it's just not the the deal it's just not the deal. You're obviously going to get written up, especially in this society, especially in this world, especially nowadays. It's like, what are you doing? What did you, what, how did you think that was going to ever run? But again, these people are insane in the membrane. So maybe I'm look. I'm not looking into it enough. Maybe I'm the one that's the dumb one when it comes to this sort of stuff. But what a crazy situation to be in, isn't it? What an absolutely nice situation. Hopefully they work it out. They probably won't. But yeah, um, I think a lot of people were basically willing to see uh, Brendan Shaw's podcast get taken off of Spotify, I would imagine, because a lot of people are not necessarily fans of him. But I thought the sharing of your own tweet on, on Instagram was very up his lane. The fucking ridiculous picture of him with his hat backwards. You know I mean, it's nearly a 40 year old man looking like a fucking adult hype beast. It's just like, oh, yeah, 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 man. Absolute tragedy, isn't it? Absolute tragedy. But yeah, what do I know? What do I know? Anyway, that's the Zinger Show, Agnes Neal Zinger Show, episode number 552, I think. If it's your first time, you like what you heard, you know what to do down below. Um, if you're listening via the podcast app, thank you once again. I appreciate you, all your support. Patreon episode, guys, is up already. It's so uploaded, so if you want to jump on the Patreon, please do. Link is in the description. And if you're listening to this podcast, as per usual, you hear a nice little tune that I've picked out for you. And if you're watching this via YouTube, unfortunately, it will just 